Hello and welcome to Timeless Truths, a sermon podcast from St. Mark Ministries in Greater Green Bay, Wisconsin. This week we kick off a brand new series, Spiritual Boot Camp, where we learn more about the Bible. In episode one, let's join Pastor John Parlow as we meet the book. So open up your heart, open up your Bible, and let's dig in to these timeless truths. Welcome to St. Mark. It is great to have you here this weekend as we begin a brand new series. A special welcome to those joining us online. Um, it's going to be a series entitled Spiritual Boot Camp. We have those now and then, off and on. But this one's specifically about the Bible, entitled It's More Than Just a Book. And today we're going to start by meeting that book as we get a deeper understanding of God's Word, the Bible. You know, a lot of people ask me sometimes in series like this that are topical, what resources can you give me because I'd like to dig deeper. And so there's a four or five people that I often read on this subject matter. One is J. Warner Wallace, very, a very prolific writer on this. Also, James Emery White, White has done a, just some incredible stuff on this, even in his blogs. There's Gary Habermas, is one of the experts in the world when it comes to New Testament itself, the documents. And then you also have Frank Turek, who speaks a lot on this. So if you want more information and some resources so you can go deeper in your study, I'll meet you at the Connect Center after. So let's get started. Every year, Stephen Prothero, the, the chairman of the religion department at Boston University gives all of his new undergraduate students a 15-question quiz. And every year they fail it miserably. It's about the Bible. Would you like to take it? I'm not going to give you all 15 of them, but I'm going to give you some, so go ahead and answer them for yourself. If you want to really be brave... Uh, talk to the person next to you so you're held accountable with your answers, okay? Not judging anybody here. Let's just see where we're at, okay? Let's see where we're at. Here we go. I'll let you talk a little. Once in a while, here's the first question. Name the four Gospels. Okay. Number two, where according to the Bible was Jesus born? Number three, President George W. Bush spoke in his first inaugural address of the Jericho Road. What Bible story was he invoking? Not as much chatter there. Okay. Um, <laughs> number, number four. What are the first five books of the Hebrew Bible or the first five books of the Christian Old Testament? Okay. Good. Number five. What is the golden rule? Don't Google it. What is the golden rule? Number six. God helps those who help themselves. Is that in the Bible? If so, where? Number seven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Does that appear in the Bible? And number eight, name the Ten Commandments. I'll give you a little time. Go ahead. I got all morning. <laughs> all right, let's see how you did. Number one, name the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Where, according to the Bible, was Jesus born? Bethlehem, a little town of Bethlehem. President George W. Bush spoke in his first inaugural address of the Jericho Road. What Bible story was he invoking? The Good Samaritan. What are the first five books of the Old Testament? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Good. So far, so good, right? What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would like them to do to you. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7. God helps those who help themselves. Is that in the Bible? If so, where? No. Who said it? Benjamin Franklin. Number seven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Does that appear in the Bible? 
Yeah. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And the Ten Commandments, right? First one, have no other gods. Second one, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Third one, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Fourth one, teenagers, honor your father and your mother. Fifth one, do not murder. Not kill, that's different. Do not murder. Number six, do not commit adultery. Number seven, do not steal. Number eight, do not bear false witness. Number nine, don't covet your neighbor's house. Number 10, don't covet your neighbor's wife or anything else of your neighbor. Show of hands, here and at home, how many of you got all of them right? A few people? Yeah, I see a few hands go up. For those people who just put their hands up, are you aware that one of the commandments covers lying, okay? <laughs> now, why did this professor have his students do that every year? Because he believed, even in a public university, that it was important for people to know the basics of the Bible, how to read it, how to interpret it, how to apply it, how to study it. And that's what we're going to talk about in this three-part series that we've entitled, uh, It's More Than Just a Book. We're going to look at the Bible from a number of different angles so that you get better acquainted with your Bible, or maybe for some of you, the first time acquainted with the Bible. And we're going to start today in our first uh, part of this three-part series by talking about three keys that I think are foundational to getting to know your Bible better. And the first one is this. The Bible technically really isn't a book. It's a library. There are 66 books written down by over 40 authors over a time period of about 1,500 years. They are amazing books, and what we often do in, in Scripture is we, we get a chance to understand that this is God's Word, but sometimes we seldom open it. Now, the books are pretty simple. Most of the books bear the name of the person who wrote it down, and it's pretty straightforward. Many of the books in the Bible are simply named after a major event that that book highlights, like Genesis, right? The Genesis or the beginning of the universe. Or Exodus, which talks about the great Exodus or the departure of God's people Israel from the slavery in Egypt underneath the leadership of Moses. Then you have a number of books written and they're named after the recipients of those letters or those books. Uh, think of, oh, go ahead and, and think of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Titus, Timothy, bo books like that, okay? Books like that. In all, there are 66 books written down at different times in history to, in different cultures, specifically for different issues with different emphases, but all of it is God's word. Second key to understanding your Bible better is to understand that the Bible is really divided into two testaments. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, and there are 27 books in the New Testament, making a total of 66 books, okay? Now, um, it's easy to remember this because think of this. There are three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons of the Trinity. What's three times three? I know you didn't expect math, but what's three times three? Nine, right? 39. That's how many books are in the Old Testament. What's three times nine? 27. That's how many are in the New Testament. The word testament is, uh, means a, a treaty or a pact between two parties. It's really a covenant and a promise, and it tells us a lot about the content of the Bible. The Old Testament is God's promise or covenants with people concerning their relationship to him before Jesus arrives on the scene. The New Testament is God's promise or covenant with people after Jesus arrives on the scene, highlighting his life, his death, his resurrection, the launch of the Christian church, and the afterlife. So in a certain sense, Jesus is really the great divider in the Bible. The Old Testament always looks forward to the New Testament. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of God's word recorded in the Old Testament. All of it being God's word. So, you have 66 books in this library we call the Bible. 
Now, if you would, take a look at the front of your Bible or take a look at the front of a, a pew Bible, and what you will see is you will see two words, the title of the book, Holy Bible. Want to make sure you know why they're there. Bible. Interesting word. As far as you know, it comes from a Greek word, biblon or biblos, and refers to an ancient port city that was famous for its reeds that grew there and that they uh, shared with people, uh, a lot like cattails, but it was called papyrus. And you see a picture of it right now. And what did they do is they would strip it, and then they take those strips and they would weave them like a cloth, and then they press all the water out of them and they dry them. And that's what they would write on. That's what they would use for paper. It was very expensive. It would also uh, deteriorate quite rapidly. Uh, so it was really important. And after, over time, what happens is he took these sheets of papyrus and they would fold them over. And they'd stitch along the seam, making the first really model of a book called a codex. Many people believe the Bible was really the original book. A third key to understanding your Bible better is to understand it's sacred. It's different than all other books. That's what we call it the Holy Bible. One of the reasons, probably the major reason we believe the Bible to be the very word of God is Jesus. If you believe Jesus is who he said he was, the son of God in the flesh, then it's what he says matters, not really really anything else ultimately. If you believe Jesus is who he said he really is, and that is he's the son of God who conquered death, then it really ultimately doesn't matter what I think about a particular book of the Bible or what you think about or agree with a certain teaching of Scripture. All that matters is what Jesus thinks. That's it, what he thinks. We believe in the Old Testament, and a major reason we do is because Jesus did. When Jesus was on this earth, when he quoted scriptures, you have to remember, he's quoting the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. Here's Jesus' unqualified endorsement of the Old Testament. He says this, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, he's talking about Hebrew letter, it's a yod, looks like a comma, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That would be judgment day. Jesus quoting Psalm 82 to a bunch of religious leaders in his day who did not like him said this, he quotes, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and then he adds this, and the scripture can't be set aside. In other words, he's saying, listen, you can't choose this, you can't choose that, you can't say this is God's word and this isn't, you got to take it, it's all or nothing. And then he goes on to, to quote uh, the psalm. But I think one of the most intriguing comments of Jesus concerning the Old Testament is when he's talking about David, and he's going to quote David, and before he does so, he says this. David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, and then he went on to go ahead and quote a portion of what David said in the psalms themselves. Go ahead and do your own work, but Jesus actually quotes from every major portion of the Old Testament, from the law, the first five books, the Proverbs and Psalms, the Psalms, Proverbs, all that area, and also from the prophets, the minor and major prophets. For Jesus, he didn't believe the Old Testament was some kind of ordinary book that you could just give or take, you know, you don't, you just throw it away. Rather, he believed it to be the very word of God, word for word, written down through the prophets by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He believed it was the word of God. But what did Jesus believe about the New Testament? Jesus laid the foundation for the New Testament to be written through the power of the Holy Spirit once again, through men he called apostles with a capital A. Remember, apostles means those Jesus personally sent out in ministry. That's important, right? Uh, They were to go out in Jesus' name, and they would go out and share Jesus' words. That's Apostles with a capital A. Uh, Jesus personally commissioned every one of those apostles, every one of them. There was no self-appointed apostles. 
Whereas every single believer and Jesus follower certainly does have the Holy Spirit living in them from the moment of their conversion, Jesus made a very clear and a gracious promise to these apostles that he was going to give them the Holy Spirit in a special measure, in a special way in their ministry and in their writing. See, just before Jesus is going to die and he's going to leave his disciples, he tells them, when I'm gone, I want you to tell everyone about what I said to you. And you can just see the panic on their face. Like, Peter, did you take notes? Uh, Matthew probably did. Um, You know, they're panicking. So Jesus gives this gracious promise. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This is why we consider the writings of the apostles to be holy scripture, holy writings, the Bible itself. And just for clarification, just make sure you understand, when we talk about the Bible being inspired, we're not talking about it being in some work that is creative and, and awesome, like maybe a, a play by Shakespeare, or a painting by Michelangelo, or some TED Talk you watched on YouTube. When the Bible talks about scripture, the Bible itself, being being inspired, it's talking about it being God-breathed. There's a passage that talks just like that in 2 Peter chapter 1 where it says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, none of God's word, came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. They didn't just make stuff up one day, decide to write something down. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul reminded young Pastor Timothy of this incredible truth. He said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's important that you understand that God didn't just give them themes or just give them a subject matter and let them write whatever they wanted to write down. That wasn't it. It's not a term paper. Rather, God gave them the very words. Jesus, in fact, speaking to his heavenly father during the ministry on this earth, says this. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. On one occasion, same subject matter, Paul writes, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The idea is that the Bible is the very outbreath of God. God didn't breathe into the words of the writers. He didn't breathe into the thoughts of the writers. God breathed out the very words he wanted them to use, and in fact, he used their very vocabularies, their personalities, and their backgrounds. That's what we mean when we say the Bible is the word of God. So when it comes to the books of the Bible, we know exactly which books those are because it's not as if a group of men got together in the first three centuries A.D. and decided to have a church council meeting where they chose which books were in and which books were out. That's not how it happened. Rather, Jesus made it very clear on this earth what he accepted and affirmed as the books of the Old Testament. And he very clearly told us that he was going to lay the foundation for the Holy Spirit to write down the New Testament through the ones that he commissioned, the apostles. So when the ancient church, years after Jesus' ministry, were going to make official what books were in the Bible through, one of them was the Council of Jamnia in 90 AD, that would be the Old Testament, and uh, in 397 AD at the Council of Carthage, that would be the New Testament, It wasn't like a a draft, an NFL draft. It wasn't a choosing process. It was a confirmation process. They simply acknowledged the books that Jesus had set aside. And that's your Bible. In the next couple weeks, we're going to take a look at some issues and questions and maybe problems people have with the Bible. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to study. But right now, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to challenge you right now no matter where you fall with what you think about the Bible. 
It is very clear that Jesus believed the Bible to be the very words of God. We call that uh, verbal, plenary verbal inspiration, word for word, right? Jesus believed that. So that's what this, here's what this means. If Jesus believed the Bible, that means you can go ahead and reject the Bible, and you can reject Jesus. But you cannot say you trust Jesus and reject the Bible. That doesn't work. It would be odd and foolish for you to say, you know, um, I, I trust that Jesus is my Savior who's going to take me to heaven one day. Uh, I trust that Jesus died on the cross for all of my sins, so my past doesn't need to be my future. I know that Jesus can do miracles, so he can do anything in my life. And I know Jesus has conquered death, which is all true, right? That's the gospel message. That's what we get to share with people as Jesus followers. But you can't say you trust that, trust in Jesus, and then say, but Jesus, when it comes to your word, it's not for me. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't buy it. After all, times change. Uh, Cultures evolve over time. And I have to be true to me. I have to live my truth. Isn't that exactly the conversations that people are having today? When they talk about what the Bible teaches concerning marriage, gender, and sexuality, what truth really is, no such thing as your truth, what heaven and, hell th- heaven and hell really are, what happens when you die, what your priorities should be as a man or woman or child. You can't say, oh, I trust in Jesus, and then ignore what his book says in all of those subjects in your life. It's Jesus who said, if you're one of my followers, the way I'll know it is you will accept the books that I have written through other men as God's word, and you will strive to obey them in every area of your life. After all, he's the one that set them aside. And that's why we call it the Holy Bible. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Timeless Truths. Whether you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener, we're glad you could join us. For more information or to support the work of St. Mark Ministries, check out our website at stmarkministries.com. Be sure to tune in next week as we continue our series, Spiritual Bootcamp. And remember, you matter and you are loved.